As we continue our discussion of the scientific method, I will make now a pause before we talk about hypothesis to, to talk about creativity. Because without it, this is as far as you're going to get. It may have been hard enough to find a problem in the first place if you're not creative to you know, come up with something new or daring enough to come up with a new way of understanding something that's already established. So even the first step may have been challenging. A lot of people can't come up with questions. You know, it's hard to come up with questions. In fact, as part of the, uh, of the practice for this uh, topic, I will ask you to come up with questions about things that you would like to know about science as part of, of, the, of the practice that you're going to have for biology this year or for space science or whatever course you're taking with me. Likewise, when you're doing the observation and you're collecting data, looking for patterns in that data so you can come up with an explanation is very difficult for someone who doesn't have creativity. So creativity plays in here because you have to lose logic and creativity to come up with an explanation that can pro possibly describe the relationship between the variables that you're looking at. They can explain the phenomena that, you, that you're studying. Because that's what the hypothesis is. It's an answer for the research question. So for example, talking about you know the effect of video games on the children's behavior. If, if playing video games which are violent will affect the, ch the children's behavior. Well, if you're going to be doing uh, this as a hypothesis, now you're going to have to propose a description of what you think the answer for that question is. What is the effect of playing video games, which are valent, on the behavior of children? So let's talk about hypothesis, okay? Before we do that, what do you see in this picture? Let's use your creativity and tell me. Pause it and try to come up with a story behind this image. So hopefully you did that. Um, when I saw the story for the first time, I thought it was a young lady that, uh, that was scared of her future. So the old lady in the back was basically the person, uh, was, it was herself. And she has behind her shoulder the, the fear of what she's going to become. And the reason she's looking to the side is that she's a, afraid of, of, of facing that future. But meanwhile, the woman is in the back is sitting there pondering, you know, uh, it, you know, is there anything that I can do to be avoided, basically. If I told this to the psychologist, he would have a field day with me. Probably would say that I'm scared of what's going to happen to me in the future and all that kind of stuff. It's clear enough. It's easy enough to evaluate. But this is exactly what this is. This is, this is a thematic assessment test. It's part of the drawings which are given to people who do a, a kind of psychoanalytic uh, psychological study where the, psych the psychiatrist or psychologist is trying to examine uh, the people's perception about the world by giving them uh, not, there is no right answer to this question. It's just the way you answer or what you say gives the psychologist insight on what you're thinking and what you're feeling. But what I made when I was looking at that picture was an inference about, about that picture. I, I looked at it. I used my own knowledge, my own experience, and I projected this experience into the picture. And so that's why this projection can be used to analyze who I am and where I am. I'm at. Likewise, that's what I'm talking about in science. Science is about making inferences. What do you see in this picture? What is this? Use your background knowledge and try to come up with an explanation of what this is. Some of you may have say, said it was an eye. Some of you are saying it's part of a tiger, perhaps. I don't know what it is. Well, well actually, that is a butterfly with an eye spot in it to try to dissuade predators from attacking it. So hopefully you caught that. Hopefully you had enough background knowledge to make that inference and get that right. But sometimes we make incorrect inferences because we do not have enough information. The reason why I talked about this is because hypotheses are based on inferences. Inferences are educated guesses about a phenomenon based on observations, which is why it's so important to undergo the second step of the scientific method before trying to do the hypothesis. If you skip observation, you, your inference will be baseless and probably incorrect and you're going to waste your time. It is important to do background research so you understand the problem better and your hypothesis makes more sense. But the hypotheses are not the same thing as inferences. In middle school, sometimes teachers say the hypotheses are educated guesses. No, that's an inference. Hypothesis is a step further than that. Hypothesis is a proposed scientific explanation for the phenomenon. It's kind of like a prediction about what would happen 
every time that you that you look at this phenomenon it describes the relationship that exists between the independent variable and the dependent variable all right but the interesting thing about hypothesis is that it's not confirmed it's just your idea about what you think is the correct prediction or the correct uh, relationship that exists between the variables but this needs to be supported then this needs to be tested so but the cool thing about hypothesis is that even when they're not supported, even when the hypothesis is uh, the data, if you do the experiment and you end up figuring out that your idea was absolutely incorrect, you will still uh, have led you to have done more investigation and then find get it's one step closer you got to true. So even when you do a hypothesis that ends up not being true, it's okay because you ended up getting closer to the truth. And remember that in science, nothing is right. So even if you were to support the hypothesis, you never really support it. You just fail to reject it. You're never right. You're just not wrong until you can find certainty of it. But there's never certainty because new evidence can always come to challenge hypotheses which have been confirmed by evidence based on experiments which were limited. So when you have better research tools, maybe there's, there's a need to reevaluate your hypothesis. Now, when writing a good hypothesis, this is what you should do, okay? Remember the magic sentence that we talked about when we did the problem statement, the effect of blank on blank. Go back to the magic sentence and use it to create your hypothesis. On the example that we've been working on, we talked about the effect of playing aggressive video games on the behavior of children, all right? So, if you did that right... You, ask, you started by asking a question. Remember, we talked about in this research question. What am I observing? What am I measuring? What is the outcome? What is the effect? And you found that that was a dependent variable. That's why you put it in the second blank of the, of the magic sentence or the problem statement. And then you ask yourself, what would I have to change? What is the cause here? What is actually being manipulated here? And that's what you put in the first blank. That was your independent variable. The independent variable... All right, and a dependent variable. A lot of people get confused about these concepts, especially with the word independent, because it makes it sound like you know you're not you're not doing anything with it. It's by itself, it's independent. Don't get confused. It's called independent because nothing is affecting it. Dependent variable is the one that depends on the independent. But if that confuses you, change the names. Think of the independent variable as the manipulated variable or the variable that you change. And a dependent variable is the variable that that responds to that change or the variable that you measure. So while you manipulate the independent, you measure the dependent. All right? Because your whole point is you want to try to see what the independent does to the dependent. What the manipulation does. What's the response? What does the cause do? What is the effect of that cause? We're going to be doing a lot of practice in class about identifying the variables on experiments so that you can get good at this. But for example, let's say if we're, if we're talking about um, the effect of, I want to find out if, if playing with the amount of light in a fish tank will make the plants grow faster or slower, what am I measuring here? I'm measuring what? The plant growth. So what is that? That's the response. That's the dependent variable. What would I be changing? I'll be changing the light, the intensity of the light. And so that's going to be my independent variable. All right. And also make sure that when you describe the variables, you're saying in a way that makes sense. You know, don't say the light, for example, in that example. You should say the intensity of the light, which is what you're actually manipulating about the light. And likewise, when you're talking about the dependent variable, don't just say uh, the growth. Be specific. The, the growth, the vertical growth of the plants. The more specific you are, the better you will be when you're designing your experiment. Another misconception about these variables is that the dependent variable does not change. I don't know who come up with that thing, but just because you're changing the independent variable, that doesn't mean a dependent variable does not change. On the contrary, you want to see if there is a change in the dependent variable because of the change that you made on the independent variable. The difference is that you're not directly manipulating the dependent variable. You're messing with the independent one, but the dependent is changing because of what you did. I am not making children be more aggressive directly. I am making them play more video games. If they become more aggressive because of that, that's something else. Do you see the difference there? You know, you don't manipulate the aggression of the children. You manipulate the playing of the video, or the type of video game they're playing. And then if they become more aggressive, you know that it was the independent variable that did that. So it's the, not the, it's the one you not directly change, but it may change because of the result.
But after you have identifier variables, it becomes pretty easy to come up with your hypothesis. Basically, be short to the point. Do not explain the variables or the rationale for your, for your thing in, in this. Basically, just go straight up and describe the relationship that exists between the two variables. All right? And you can try to do it as an if-then statement or something similar that establishes a one-to-one -one relationship between the two variables. So, for example, uh, the best way to construct it is to do if blank, then blank. Where the first blank, you're going to write down if this is done to the independent variable, then this is done to the dependent variable. So the, the first blank is what's done to the independent variable. It's the change that you create. The second blank is what happens to the dependent variable because of the change you created. So, do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, so, for example, on the example that we're doing, we could say, if children play more aggressive video games, then they will display more aggressive behaviors in school. Or they will have more incidents of aggressive behaviors in school. You could also phrase it in a different way, as long as it's still a one-to-one -one relationship. Something like, the more aggressive video games one plays, the more instance of aggressive behavior in school the child will have. But it's still a one-to-one -one relationship. That's how you write a hypothesis, and it starts with identifying those variables, and you can do that if you did the problem statement right. And that's why if you do things step by step, you will have no problem at all. Remember that the hypothesis part of writing a lab report goes along with this, and on that video, I'm going to explain in detail how to write a great hypothesis.